Um, I go by the name of Don McKay, and uh, I'm here daily, 7 p.m. I got a special guest in the building, and uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. What up? It's the BOSS boss, man. You know what I'm saying? Chilling. Boss, man. What's, what's good? What's good? I have not had a chance to talk with you in, in quite some time. Yeah, yeah. It's been a minute since we got to kick it. Definitely, definitely. Um, So, you know, I want, I want to go back to the beginning, and um, when you were a kid, did you know that you wanted to be in this rap game? Yeah, most definitely. Like, I went through a stage in my life. It was like a uh, fifth grade. And my mother and my father, they were both incarcerated. So it was like to spend time. At first, I started off with like drawing. And then dudes around my way, they used to joke around and freestyle. So I, I started off writing other people raps, which was crisscross. So it's like, I remember one time I wrote that. And then I sent it to my mother, and she thought it was dope. And then... um. My father, I did actually did a, a crazy rewrite, like One Love, the Nas head that was locked up when he wrote to his man. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to that. So it was just like weird stuff getting the response as a young kid at that age. So I'm like 10 or 11. And then I did a talent show doing crisscross and I won. So since then, I was like, I want rap. Like, I kind of figured wow. I'm definitely that young. So sure. like you were, you were taking, just like flipping the lyrics around and... and, and I mean, at, at like some, a remix, song. yeah, it was like a remix. But some, I flipped that the one love joint, but like the crisscross joints, I I wrote like their whole album and just used to perform it, like for my uncles and all that. And they grew up, they um was in the hip hop. Like I come out the um closet and shit, like with their sneakers on and shit, doing <laughs> shit. Like I was in elementary school, you feel me, in the fifth grade, so mm -hmm. I was doing weirdo stuff like that. But I knew I was wanted to really do that for real though. Yeah. How um, course I guess when I first met you, you were uh, with Nek. Yeah, yeah. How how did that group start? Um, so when I was going through that time, I was living with my grandmother, Northeast Baltimore, a street called Wadsworth Way, and uh, like one door between it, so it was like two doors down. It was another dude. My um, that was that was Cash. That was in uh, Nek. He was like three years older than me. He was in a rap too. Ironic. So in the beginning, he was writing my raps. That's what he was crazy because you know what I'm saying. I was young, and then um, we got into it, started taking it serious. Was doing demos like in my basement and recording stuff, you know what I'm saying? Just rapping other people beats. And then when we got in high school, you know what I'm saying? That was but keep in mind through middle school, we were still doing talent shows, doing little stuff here and out there, but it didn't really catch fire. But when we got like that, um, I was still in middle school actually, he got in high school. He had met three other dudes to um that's heavy gold. We already knew Tom Manson, he was an OG from run away, and then my man DO. And then he was like, Yo, I got some other dudes to rap, you know what I'm saying? They come and check me out. So we just start spitting, and it was like we just had a connected, like we thought we was the firm, like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Cause everybody favorite rapper was Nas. So yeah. that's what we all had in common. So since we all had that in common, we just like started the group NEK. We was all from Northeast Baltimore and that's really how that came out. You know what I'm saying? Everybody at that point was just really chasing their dreams. Like every Friday where everybody was going to the clubs or even trying to go to clubs and doing anything, we getting a clue mixtape going in my basement. You know what I'm saying? Drinking. It was even so crazy. It got so serious by the time um, everybody got older and was like in 10th or 11th grade. We we drinking more wet, hooking school, got in each other lockers like crazy shit. We really <laughs> thought we was really into that lifestyle. Thought we was the firm. It was like real shit. What uh what made you uh want to go solo? Um, that was never really the plan because I mean to be honest, like I said, my man Cash, I looked up to sort of him because I was the youngest person in the in the group, like at least by like between eight by two and a half years or three. So I was sort of like following up. I'm the, you know what I'm saying? I was the little little brother in the group at that time. But when we, when we would start putting out music seriously, like we had the, our own tour, we had the NEK tour, and then uh, mixtapes coming out of Shoot City all for free. And had an investor when this became, I seen something that was real. I took it more serious than them, I seen. Girl issues. I ain't never letting a girl stop me from going to the studio. I seen dudes doing that. Like they handle yeah. it abroad too much, but I'm still there writing my raps and doing it. So it got to the point if I'm going this hard and this is my life, I got to push me. So when we got to the point, the plan we put out the, um, we met up with One Up Entertainment. Shouts out to them. They was doing um, Unleash the Dragon with Cisco at that time. And we um, opened up for a, um, a tour for Peter Guns and Lord Tariq. And we, that's how we got put on with them. Like the promoter put us on with them, was like, I got some dope boys from Baltimore. We drove to DC, rap fam, so they let us in the studio. So with all that going on, we put out the NEK project and the plan was always to do like the Wu-Tang kind of thing. It was like whoever got the most buzz next, get a solo project. Yeah, I was in a group at that time, but 
people everybody we passed the music out to was saying the dude Jimmy Hash, yo, he just dope. And it was just like naturally coming back. And like I said, on top of that, I was doing a lot of work. Like if you listen to the NEK album, I'm on every song. We had 16 songs. I was on every song, not for no favoritism. I just always had my verse and my verse never got cut. So it kind of like fell into the natural thing. It definitely wasn't like I just better, just like my worth ethic. And I started getting the um, appreciation and the buzz because of my worth ethic. I was working harder than everybody in the group. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. Uh, I I remember this time period you're talking about, and some of you, some of y'all shows I DJ at some of y'all shows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, during you, that you time period. Down? Yeah, and I, I I definitely saw that you had a like a stage presence. It's like a you know, it, mm. you definitely you know separated yourself from the um, you know from the group. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Law and Order. Classic, um, classic. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And a lot of people uh, that was like their first introduction to you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the recording process for that. The recording process was super genuine. Like it went from everything to just riding around drinking me and my man Dio. Cause that's what Bobby wrote the NEK album. So that's the system we came me and my man. So he stuck with me to give people that process. When I went solo, the dude Cash and Heavy Gold left the group. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And um, so Tone Mets and uh, Dio stuck around. We always had that chemistry, me and Dio working on rap. So I used to drive around in the car, not even popping shit. I had a Lexus back then, so I was still doing shit. So we get some liquor, may get some bitches that night, whatever we doing, but the whole time we playing instrumentals, riding back, just vibing out. So then I take that and talk to my man, Rich Neasy, that's the leader from One Up. If we do it, we would have phone conversations before we made any song. About, about, about had the song? Day to me, yo, guess up with this shit, yo. Or I went <laughs> through this shit with my girl, or my, my mother, like really venting and like talking. So him being a dope producer, will always make me kind of put that in my music and be like, well, I got this beat, yo, that concept you said or that topic you said, let's put it to that. So that would be the process. And I go get in with him and with some joints, um, we just lock in like maybe after the club, after we promoting at the show and just get in. But it was always, well, I think the album was dope. Every song had a meaning to me special. And you know what I'm saying? That only one producer for the most part worked on that album. Like the other records I cut, it was after the bass was done. And it was like, I think I had like four other producers on there, which was dope. Especially shout out to Rod Lee, how we came up with that. It was a special anthem with Land of the O, a classic. Definitely. But, I mean, but the process was definitely pure and really communicating with the producer. Like, I got to give a shout out to Neezy for doing that, my OG, keeping me focused of staying on topic of anything I wanted to rap, rap about. You know what I'm saying? And making sure what just wasn't a mixtape. Because sometimes when you do mixtapes, it's just like, all right, I don't give a fuck today. I'm going to just say this. You know what I'm saying? That's what mixtapes is fun for. But it's like, I grew up of classic albums, The Chronic, Ready to Die, like um, Illmatic, it was written, Reasonable Doubt, like shit where a motherfucker wanted to get a point across. So that was like real special when my um, producer made sure that came through. You know, music marks time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when you look back at some of the songs that you made during that time, like when you hear those songs now, does it take you back to whatever you was going through at that time period? Yeah, it definitely does. And, and it's like a weird way because sometimes like i listen to it be like all right i see how i got better in this way then i'd be like damn i'm actually losing something that i had right there like what i had right there was so pure i gotta get that back like what was i doing right there what was i thinking and when i really came up as weird as it is say i think i really didn't have too many kids in the world except about being dedicated to music and getting my point across like no matter what song it was what i'm gonna say about my mouth it was really like how i really felt it was like venting like if i had a diary it's like i was really writing to myself it was like, it got to be pure. And I definitely think over the years, that's something I straight away, once the music business get into your music, they sure to take you out of that element because there's so much other shit by people telling you to make songs. But that's what I, I give and take from it. How, uh, during that time period, I mean, you were, you had the crown, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure that you, you had a lot of, um, you know, got a lot of hate at that yeah, time yeah. period, but a lot of love as well. The love outweighed the hate, but definitely the hate come with the love. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, people always talk about, you know, putting the city on right? Uh, and, and that type of thing. And you are one of the few people that had the opportunity to actually do that. Right. What um, when you started to really get recognition outside of the city, uh, what, like, what was that transition like going from just being Baltimore to expanding? Um. It was receptive for the most part. It was definitely positive because when you go, and that was the time when the wild was popping. Everybody just went like, yo, is it really like that? It's like a wild. And sometimes I used to find myself saying, nah, but then I had to really think 
after we get into conversation, we're like, yeah, it is, especially when they tell me how it is where they from. Like every hood, every city got a hood and got a ghetto. It's like the fact that we had the spotlight and they seen on HBO. It was like, well, yeah, for the most part, it really is like that. But when you live in there every day, it's not really that big to you to you go somewhere else and be like, well, damn, people are a little bit more friendly here. It ain't, ain't that bad. It's a little <laughs> bit more opportunity here. Yeah. It's like it ain't so closed in. You start to find out everything. So it's like, damn, I was like, I had to realize not to knock Baltimore, how much we were behind just to the culture of music, the music business, the kind of music we was making and the way we should just do things and just live life, period. We was kind of sort of like slow to, to that atmosphere. But people embrace us. And I think I learned a lot of stuff. Um, one of the negative things was it was none of the pioneers that that were in the music or could do help would help Baltimore artists. Like we didn't sort of stick together in the industry. It wasn't much of us, you know what I'm saying? But the, that was at a time is like where I'm not even gonna say no names because everybody knows what it is. People just wasn't on the same core of helping the helping the artists that come in. And when you look at any other city that broke, like you look at Dre, who makes sure he signs Compton artists. Yeah. for a reason you know what i'm saying it's been doing this since nwa that's why it's so successful you look at la reed who puts on a jermaine dupri you know who puts on an outcast who, or and it just continues whether it's an artist who he put in the a r or producer on they built the lineup so when you see atlanta pop with jeezy finally that didn't come out of nowhere that came when new york was running it and the south couldn't get no play the south kept piece by piece putting their own shit on you know what i'm saying and that's how uh, um a spot like that got to grow so i was like i think we was ignorant to that fact like we didn't really know no better yeah, that, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and I, I think that with the artists, because the the DJs here and um, and FM radio is so like they want to lock the Baltimore artists out or they, just one or, you know, just only one at a time. We can't we can't have two, you know, or, or three or four <laughs> or whatever, you know, because it's like that. It's so they make it more competitive than it has to be right. with each other. I think they had a, had a problem with feeding the heat. But but in the shout out to them, um, and this really not not nobody from Baltimore, but Victor Starr. If y'all remember, he was program director. Yeah. Which and this is where you let you know his knowledge. He was coming from New York, yeah. So he knew how you run a radio and pop a local spot. Like he had me with a, I had a job on the radio, like a rap attack. Like when I had a deal. I mean, you had Paula banging, you had Huli banging. I think it was um, it was a couple of people, but it was it wasn't as much as now, but it was definitely like three to four people. Molly had his shit when it could come and it was like they was trying to do it but if you look at where the other artists didn't and it's not like bigging myself up by me being with one up entertainment that came from the music industry you know what i'm saying off the cisco thing sure you know how i know we had a different platform we knew that we could give away free cds and make the money back like you know what i'm saying because we knew it was like i seen this shit work like people were doing it so we was a sort of ahead of the game and i think that's why it generally worked because at that time it was like baltimore don't support no artists but it was like y'all really not putting in the work to get the support, you know what I'm saying? And putting out the quality of music, because I, I became a later fan, except for certain key artists, like shout out to Tim Trees. I think he was a wave ahead of his time. And um, certain things, I also thought our music was real, not advanced and local. Like, I don't know if he was ready, as far as the artists that was here at, at that point. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I mean, you, you know, you, you've had a lot of records that got radio play here um, and, and beyond. And this is a this is a tough market. It's, it's it's tough to get your city to play your records. Uh, what record do you think is your most popular record? Hmm. Out, outside this market, this popular is probably "Break Me Off." Yeah. The most classic would be off the record. Like you, it, it's funny how you how you get that, and it, that's even for me because this is a transition I went through. Believe it or not. As far as actual money I seen in my pocket, I made more money off Break Me Off than I made off the whole Jermaine the pre deal. How I added up. It's like knowing the business and, and seeing what that got me because I got a pub deal with Break Me Off. Right. And I only got a single deal, which is weird. I got a record deal with the other thing for selling records. I get one song and then get the pub deal to just outmatch all that. It was like as far as money I, I see, because it's like a lot of people, the deal was really for 1.5. That you break it down like it wasn't no lies. They just don't tell you how everything is cut. You need money for events, certain money for living, certain money to record. So it ain't like I get a half a million in my pocket just to right. play with. You know what right. I'm saying? But when you get your pub deal, it's all your bread. Right. A little right. different type of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> how how ironic was it to work with Jermaine Dupree considering that 
you know, in your early days, you were, you know, working on some crisscross <laughs> music and, and he was behind. I, I'll tell you how super ironic this is. And a lot of people don't know the story. Some of the people close to me. So when I go back that I was in a group hash and cash, right? They came from that. We used to go down. My uncle used to had a, there's a dude named Eddie. There was an A and R for social death. He used to take us down. I actually was there the day they told us that they was going to decide to sign Bow Wow and they was telling me about it before we even came out. But I was getting shot as a group with Hash and Cash. We had a demo. So before I flew out that night, this is my hand of God, my mother told me, I don't know what it is, but God is telling me, you with Richard, whoever you're going down here with, this blessing is not meant for them. You have to get it on your own, but you will sign with Jermaine Dupree. When we went down there, they didn't sign us. They turned it down. And it was funny just to sign like about 10 years later. That was right. like, so ironic and take the crisscross and that's a true fact like that nothing, is crazy nothing is like made up or fixed with that shit. what <laughs> uh a, a lot of times and i know you you've met different people that you uh looked up to you mm -hmm. know when you were coming up uh what was it like when you actually had a chance to meet jermaine dupree did he did he live up to what you thought i mean what was that like yeah and a First of all, I definitely say shout out to him in a relationship. I, I, I say yay and nay because like when you meet somebody, especially you think this is, especially at that young, you think this is meant to be, you get to get the thing, you know what I'm saying? Everything is popping. For the first year, so much politics blocked me and Jermaine's relationship. Because like what a lot of people don't know is that I was never assigned a social death, which has probably been a better thing for me. Like knowing- To sign directly to I was yeah. signed directly to Virgin because we decided since we sold independent records that you one up, slash virgin try to have our own situation but in a game like that you know people like jermaine which is bosses you know what i'm saying they play for keep so it's really their thing like they never want to tell you that i only really care about my shit. but that's just how any natural person really will go if you watch when jay when jay-z had um def jam all the artists was complaining like he only putting out rockefeller shit before it flopped so he was there for janet and so so deaf that's whatever you know what i'm saying janet ran version um knowing that i'd assign straight to him so me saying that it took a year and other information from him me and him to kick it with ourselves to go to the club you know what i'm saying to kick it in the studio to get a relationship i would have wanted that from the jump so he would know what kind of artist he got it was just people in the middle so much like you send a song and there's too much politics that was just going on like when records weren't coming out they told me instead of me getting to talk to jermaine and somebody else saying it's gonna cost too much to clear the tupac sample for off the record but then later they want to clear the biggie joint for the untouchable joint when we didn't want to push the record it's just like so much bullshit like that but after i got to know him and we got to kick it like it was around my second mixtape yellow tape he was telling me how dope i was he told me one time in the club and this really touched me this is real shit. he was like yo i just came with envy i didn't know you was that nice i'm like what you mean i was like you signed me he was like yeah nigga, i signed you but i didn't know you was that nice i really just listened to the whole mixtape with envy we was sitting there banging and shit. And I was like, you really a jewel. Don't never let nobody change you. Just keep doing what you do, no matter what situations let up. So that was like, looking back, I was like, damn, I had somebody that's really a legend really tell me that like face to face, no bullshit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Got in the kicker. So, but there's been times like when I lived in Vegas, I caught him at the, um, he DJing somewhere. I can come through, you know what I'm saying? I've been in Atlanta four o'clock in the morning. He let me come through the studio. So that's why I said, it ain't no love lost. I just think at that time we didn't seize the moment. You know what I'm saying? And we did, we, when we was in the studio together and cut two records with no ID, and then we did one with Scotch Torch, I think we was getting closer than that, but it was so much politics happened with that label that when I say just shut it down, it just didn't make sense no more. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I wish. I'm gonna tell them to put me on a rap game though. That's what we're gonna do in season three. I wish it had, I wish it had worked <laughs> out differently. I, I remember when the, when the situation had broke, I was like, okay, he, he yeah. ready to do it because I, Jermaine Dupree is good at, at working that game. And um, yeah. and I, I wish that that had worked out different. Um, I want to talk a little bit about had some tension. Um, maybe tension is the wrong word, but, but what are your thoughts on Wale? I think he's a, um, a, a, a dope artist. I think he's talented. I mean, I, I, could, I can't say and tell you like I'm a super fan of all his music, but I'm a fan of some of his songs. It's like really dope, especially when you do the little poetry records for females, like with Usher, the um, Lois, Flower Bomb, and stuff like that. Yeah. The uh, the straight rap and spitting Wale, I ain't, I mean, just as a fan of hip hop, I, I can't put them on like no super dope scale. I'm just being honest. And that has nothing to do with our past. It's just me as a fan. How, how, <laughs> did, how did that, um, how did that get out of control? Um, 
you know, it was funny. We was talking about that. So I, I didn't, when I used to have that answer, I didn't dig back. I think I made a mistake that I never knew I did something in Wale that I didn't realize I did. He shout out to Alice, DJ Alize. He was a big supporter of breaking my music in DC. And that's when he was coming up on and real talk. Wale had seen me outside the station one day and was like, yo, what's up? Yo, I think, you know what I'm saying? That off the record joint is dope. You're like one of my favorite artists. This is real talk. You know what I'm saying? He would have to lie to y'all if he didn't say that. We outside of 93.9. And Alize would want us to do a record together, but he sort of pressed the issue just to bring it up. And I would tell my producer, I was like, I don't know if I really like you. I don't think the music that dope. Can you get another verse or something? Or what kind of song we want to do? So we never pressed the issue. But we had seen each other prior, past then, was cool, seen each other in LA, met mutual people that wanted down. I never knew it was an issue thinking that deep. So what happened was, for the, they did it for me, we was um, at, uh, what was it? Down the power plant, at, uh, I forgot the name was M, M, wherever they did the club at. And they had him just around no hands pop. And uh, he was open, he was the main act and I was under him, it was a DC Baltimore show, a big thing. A lot of people were packed night. So anytime we see each other, I see him in DC, we pop bottles, we take pictures, we cool. So this night, when we seen we was up, near his section it was a it was around howard homecoming and the dude was like uh yeah he was like you know i ain't book you on the thing but since you book here while they perform won't you come up here and perform at the club tomorrow you know what i'm saying i do sort of do the same show we work some up it was like cool so the um it's me and him sit right there the way his gesture was kind of off to that but that ain't what ticked it though so i'm like all right cool he, he kind of like on some shit. all right cool i i breeze it and we go talk so my man the interviewers was in there. I was like, I want to do a DC Baltimore interview. Can y'all get it come up? So I tapped my man. I say, Why they like he kind of on some shit? Yo, I'm not going up there to ask a nigga do an interview. This is real talk. I told my man DR I said, if y'all want to go set it up, make sure this shit cool. Cause I was like, he gonna make me feel a type of way, and it's gonna be some bullshit over nothing. You know what I'm saying? So they went up there and uh went and grabbed him. So they had said it was cool. So they gave me the word back to my man. It's like so they walked me up to back to the stage where we were doing an interview. His, once we get all on stage with the cameras, his, his, uh, a female manager was like, he's not doing no interviews before we perform or nothing. So I'm right here talking to Wally, so I'm tapping. It was like, yo, tell her we good. We do the interview. This nigga start texting on his phone. <laughs> like, like this, put his head. I'm like, yo, nigga, tell her, tell her we straight to do this shit. They trying to kick us all the shit out of Then the security stepping in between us. And we're up there. So I was like, damn, this bitch nigga on some shit like that. Cool. Fuck it. We do the show. I perform. I rock. Getting the Baltimore love. Still was even kind of because I'm always my hip hop shit is big. I don't take shit too personal, but it's only got certain shit when somebody piss you off. Is that um, I rock, shot him out. He about to come on. When he go off, something about his mic go off. It like cutting it out when he rapping, so he couldn't finish show. When he believing it, you could hear it over the mic. You like fuck Baltimore. That's why I don't like coming to this shit. Oh my, just shit like that. So I was like, you know what? This ain't really no street beef. I'm I'm I live hip hop and I'm a go I'm just go handle it. Fuck this nigga. Now. So that's how that just really came out. And then from doing that, there's no hands. He's saying shit back and forth. They got people popping shit on Twitter. They're going to do this. I'm seeing people on airplanes. Nothing's happening because it ain't that serious. I know it's just right. rap shit, but y'all right. on front. Say a song, my nigga will shut the fuck up. And then it just goes on and, and goes on stop. But it ended up getting um, squashed through Mitri people that said it's just going to, they was worried about it's going to start a Baltimore and DC thing, which they had a point. Because yeah. I remember when he was down Ram's head, that was the day he called to the radio. It was so many people from my neighborhood or any nigga. We going to a show. We going to fucking show up. But then I'm like, yo, my nigga, this is a hip hop beef. This ain't no real shit. So I was, I'm not right. going to a nigga show and fucking up this type of shit we got going on. Right. After that, this was just like died out. It wasn't worth it. You know what I'm saying? I guess at this point, after the 50 Cent Ja Rules or the Biggie and Pac shit, you can't no longer do what hip hop was based on and rap beef. You, as you look at Jay Z and Nas, they did that shit and it was a sport. They told people in interviews, now I, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to see Nas and speak. But I ain't gonna be no shit. We ain't crossed some lines yet. You know what I'm saying? So anybody lived like that, I just handled it my way because I felt disrespected. And it was just that. But I think he felt learning when I was talking to my producer. I think he always tried to curb me for that old shit that I never did a record. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I didn't even really catch it like that. So I mean Yeah, so so would you would you do a record with him now? Yeah. Yeah. He probably wouldn't want to do it, but yeah. I would do it. Yeah, well, I mean that's, that's what's up. I, yeah. When when the whole thing was going down, I thought it was good. I thought you know, even even though it was it was tension, but I thought it was good. It was it was good energy. It was making people pay attention. Right. But the flip side of that is is DC and Baltimore does have tension normally. So it's just and it, that's what that's yeah. what some OGs was telling us. Yeah. Like y'all looking at it is going to be some other shit. Other people going to take it out, and it ain't worth it. 
Yeah. And which it, I was like, all right, this nigga ain't like totally fucking just pissed me off that I will say it's worth it. Like, fuck everything. So it was like kind of cool. I'll leave him alone. Plus, he wouldn't really respond on the rap shit. So, yeah. And if you look at something he screamed up there, if you listen when he yelling on the phone with Pork Chop, he say, when this nigga was up, he didn't reach back. And I, like, I caught that and was like, I didn't know that I was supposed to reach back. Like, I didn't know he was on that wave. He took something shit personal that I'd never even seen. Yeah, yeah. And so, turned into something else. So he was, was like, he was saying that, that you could have you helped him. Back to do it. Yeah. You could have helped him in his mind, and you did. Yeah. It is the way he was looking at it. But, the, but the, see that, I mean, he curved me one time after that, before No Hands, when he got dropped, we was supposed to meet at the studio, had me book, and then I ain't diss him because of that. I was like, maybe the nigga was busy. Shit just don't happen. But you totally disrespect me to my face. It's something I know you did it. So I don't got to give you the benefit of the doubt. I know I'm sitting there tapping you, telling you to get your mans, and you got me in my hometown, security moving me out of my shit. Like, yeah, that's crazy. That's just some foul shit. But he got a reputation of sort of being, you seen Meek had a problem with him. On being artist, my man Raheem, when it was going down, he was like, Yo, if you went from DC, we'd have been did it. Your dude got a problem, but I guess this is a while away. Yeah. Um, what what are your thoughts on uh Reggie Reg? Rest in peace, definitely a Baltimore legend. I know it definitely uh did everything you could do to help me when I was gonna come up and really let me know what I mean by that. It wasn't on handouts. I was proving myself, seeing myself, you know what I'm saying, grind out since some Butterman would be a rap attack, keep giving them my shit. Either they ain't listen one time to keep passing out CDs. So, you know what I'm saying? I definitely seen him try to put on for the city from the jump start. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, K Swift. Oh, that's the homie. You know what I'm saying? I got definitely um RIP to her and thank uh a lot on my career. And you know what's funny about that? I remember me and Swift. When I was in the NEK thing, we had to face down ass up shit, right? She had the caddy truck. Could we bombed. This is what I mean. I worked harder than niggas in the group. Not only did I rap, push the shit, I'm hopping out of my car, taking it down as the rain. I'm banging on her window. She made me wait on the phone and roll down the window, then take the shit. I swear I had to wait for like three minutes. <laughs> but see, that's the humblest shit. It's cool. It was like she ain't even a, she a girl, so I can't like just right. all the way buck. I gotta eat this shit. It was the dude we probably been beefing, like been fighting, because she definitely horsed the shit out of me. But we, we laughed about that because she actually was one of my biggest promoters. You know what I'm saying? But that's just how the game go. I mean, she was Kay Swift at the time. She probably get people handing her records every fucking day. Yeah. And I ain't, ain't like I came up to her formally and had a meeting. I was trying to bang on her car and shit, like on my hustle. But it was cool. I always had a memory of her. That was like dope. Um, We were talking off air about this. And, um, you know, you've you been putting out a lot of records. And uh, I was just trying to figure out what has it been that sparked you know, this this movement that you want right now? I think one of it is uh, shouts out to like artists like J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar, definitely Drake, Meek Mill, um, underground artists, Chance to Rap, but just seeing people that they ain't got a, they ain't all the way in the trend of what's going on or what's popping in the club, do they thing, and then some of them, like that we named, did find a way to start popping records in the club, but it was built from a fan base of just straight rap. You know what I'm saying? It was like you grow up so much in the hood, even when I'm in the studio, my niggas telling me, Yo, I know you are big rap. We try and get a check. Niggas don't listen to rap no more. Like, you never, any artist can tell you that. How many niggas, like, what you, niggas don't listen to rap no more. And so when you be like, Oh shit, you're right. Cause everything I hear on the radio ain't, <laughs> ain't really rap where we come from. And when I go in the club, it ain't. But then you now on the internet stage took over and you start to hear it. And it's like, okay, fuck you. Cause niggas do listen to rap again. They you do. know what I'm saying? So it put me back in my zone of just being a, a pure, what I wanted to do, coming to expressing myself artistic and doing the music. And then another thing, just trying to um, block out the business side. Cause like when I first um, got back serious and I was putting out records, I wasn't all the way an artist. Like, as I was paying for my own shit, I'm behind the promotion, I'm trying to figure out my own marketing plan, shoot my videos. It's like, now I'm not an artist, I'm thinking too much. You know what I'm saying? You need people around you that can sort of give you that vibe. It's that like, team, all right, yeah. I want to spit. So now my producer say, well, you should spit to shit like this. And then somebody else would say, the pictures should look like this. He wish your idea and then flip it for you. You need good people around, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that that was that that was definitely missing from my career of like the last five years. It was just like so much shit was just on my own. So a lot of people may be younger than me, but I built relationships with them where they giving me input that I can respect because they know my vibe. And some of my older people around just got me like geared up. Like I sometimes I send them records, they be like, yo, that shit dope in a hit, but they ain't the shit I want to hear from you. Just be raw like that. So it'd be like, yo, what you mean? But it's like I sort of started figuring out what they meant. They just wanted to hear me to just be a pure artist, like not really 
give a fuck or chase a style. Just like go for it. Yeah. Get your message across. If if there was one thing that you could change about the music scene, what would that be? The fakeness of it right now. Like you don't majority at least 85% of the artists are, are stunting from and they stunting because they feel like they have to. Trust me, it's the same thing I went to and I understand them. Like you People are a lot of people are scared to tell a story. You look at Instagram and you get likes. It's even like for females that you watch. I don't watch girls take a bunch of pictures that never took their clothes off and then start it and they get more likes and then they chase that like that's them. And they only doing them on purpose. You obviously could tell because now you sign an artist off his Instagram likes. It ain't the last time I say, Yo, I just heard his, he had no views and nothing. This shit was the dopest record ever. And I signed him. It's all about what was the numbers doing and what was this doing? So it's like if I could change that, like if, the execs or whoever, maybe if a nigga just at you that shit and ain't no views, to, they have a little nigga checking that shit out and see if it's dope. You know what I'm saying? Because not all this, all artists got money or got a team, but they might got some dope shit. And you make an artist do fake shit, buy fake belts, fake jewelry, lie, get fake money. Motherfuckers is robbing their mother and killing their kids to be fake and stunting with some bread. Like, where the fuck did that ever come from in music and hip hop? You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you could be a school kid and rap about that shit. We like it. You know what I'm saying? J. Cole proved that. It was like, it can happen, but it's like, it's hard because all they see is like all the bullshit getting all the likes and all the hype. So but that's why people just caught up in the hype of, I wish I could change the hype and snatch it away, yeah. away from music for real. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's true. And that, and, and that is a, a definitely unfortunate thing. Uh, but like you said, social media is, is, is good and bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you can get music to people that you never would have been able to ever touch before. That's the good part, and then, like you said, that that's the bad part. What uh, 2016? What what can we expect from Boss Man 2016? Okay, so we got the uh, Summer 16 mixtape coming out. You know what I'm saying? That's um, just me barring up, giving y'all some real. I ain't even gonna say vintage. I'm just back on my wave. Just some Boss Man shit. You know what I'm saying? You want to hear me spaz out? It's a mixtape. It's like 70 percent other people beats. I snuck a few original tracks in there. Then I got the um, Boss Shit Only LP coming out. Um, sort of like the boom boom clap. Like a, a, I don't want to just put a stigma on it and say it's hip hop, but basically the whole album is a lot of remake samples. You know what I'm saying? Some classic joints. Like I remade the um album cover of LL Cool J I'm Bad. Like you know what I'm saying? You that that's what that's going to be. That's dropping around like 9 11, and then Law and Order two coming out around election time. So that's like oh that's like everything is done and and them projects is really coming out because like the mi the first mixtape we finished we just finished that today. Me and my man Peso, shout out to him. Peso music. He got some fire on the producer tip. And uh the other joint is just a mixing process. And then I got like four records for long order too. So it's like I'm definitely uh, so I see you still working with Raw Lee. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. We cooked up a couple of joints. We just getting started. You know what I'm saying? It's on the lowest um land of the old remix. It got Tate on there. Uh, a couple other people I don't, don't want to name because we're not putting that out yet. And then um we got like three other joints. That we just cooking out. I did that record. Is what everybody need to check out. That's my new single that's out now. You know what I'm saying? Go to uh, Boss Man Be More on IG or Boss Man Be More on SoundCloud. Hit the links and check that out. You know what I'm saying? That's definitely five. We about to shoot the video for that. Yeah, I was reaction about that. Rob got that classic sound. Bro. I mean, so much politics behind the game back then. Why a couple records when I was signed to Virgin didn't come out? Just people just don't know. I've been always on putting this baltimore sound on like if we ever get with envy y'all ever had us better he would tell you like i was just fighting for i was like yo i know where to work i know where to pop i don't give a fuck what y'all saying like if what, i pop that shit on my own <laughs> i know it's the new wave and you look though look our biggest artist right now shout out to take cobain to remake a bank rose you know what i'm saying it didn't go all the way natural but it put him on a platform and people respect the sound if i was him i would keep pushing that like you don't only got to cut them kind of records but it still need to be in your you know what i'm saying in your style of music yeah you know what I'm saying? That's very important coming from a, a town that don't really have an identity. Absolutely. The um this generation uh that's coming right now, you know, like uh like Tate Cobain, uh Tato, you know, don't, these these guys, what what is your relationship with with this generation? Um I can say personal relationships is probably with um maybe Tate and um Damon Blue. Um uh, yeah, Tate don't swing past yeah. and see each other, always talking about getting up is love. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to him supporting YGG Tate. I just ran to him to the club every day. You know what I'm saying? We got acquainted. I don't really know a lot of them personally, but when we see each other, you know what I'm saying? You know who I am, and it's always love. And 
it's funny, like, you know what I'm saying? I got teenage daughters, so they, they rock their music. I'm always banging with them, so I'm down with their wave. And um, like one of the records I'm, I'm definitely banging right now is why be a scholar that a whole lot of money. I really like that record. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I'm definitely feeling their wave. I like it because it's original. Yeah, it is. You know what I'm saying? It, it ain't is. um certain part of the certain music. You might be surprised that I say that because it ain't like, it's quote unquote rap lyrically. But I definitely feel like when you hear Moose and them rap, it's something pure from their generation. Like it ain't phony or fake. You know what I'm saying? I just hate hearing stuff just watered down. So it's like definitely Baltimore and they represent for something. So I think if they stick with it, study their art, don't get caught up in local success. That's the best advice I can give it to them because this is a small market and you probably really not going to see the money that you deserve and you want. If you don't open your brain, you educate yourself outside of this market, work with producers outside of there and just still bring it back home. And like they got to stretch themselves. That's the best advice I can give them. Yeah. And that's, and that's, uh, that's good words. Um, Last question. This is a curveball. What What are your thoughts on Donald Trump? Fuck Donald Trump. And they ain't even because of the song. I think Donald Trump is fucking disgusting, but I think he will win because we're in a disgusting world today. And I really think in 10 years, it won't even be no more president elections. I think we about, we're really going to this new world order where it's going to change. It's like if you look at our past, we had kings and queens before we had government. So it was like a lot of people get caught in a moment, don't really know their history. And it's like, so this shit is showing you how it changed. They so don't care. The biggest thing they could give for us was a black president after George Bush. You know what I'm saying? To change it. Like, look, look what his whole campaign was eight years ago. Change. Change. Right. What have we changed? Like transgenders, gay marriages, uh, religion is definitely thrown out the door. Even more like it was programming us to change. So we can say, let's give these person. They say that we saw about change because they're black people are not slaves no more. We don't shit on them. You got a black president. Ha ha. It's like it's fine, but the shit don't even really matter. I'm not even voting. <laughs> like people were saying, I'm like, it's don't, it's a waste of time. They proved that shit. They wanted Obama to win. He was gonna win no matter what. That was already planned after they cheated for Bush a couple of backs, like I said on off the record. So it's just like I think um he's gonna win because people respect money now. Like no matter you could be a rat, you could be a snitch could be a rapist like but if you, i mean it proves like i hate to going back on my old lyrics like i'm speaking some crazy shit but look how r kelly just got away with that because he had money and nobody gave a fuck if that was the, the sub you know what i'm saying the subway nigga got crucified because he wasn't popular and didn't didn't have the shit i think it's both disgusting what they both did but it's just like if you got money you get away with it and what they teach everybody is just money fuck everything just get money you listen to the program in the world right now so mm -hmm. Donald Trump will be our next president. And it's going to be a disaster. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> like, like real shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, um, yeah, if Don Donald Trump becomes president, I, I, you know, I don't know. Part of me says that it would, you know, that's just the end. And then a part of me says they got enough checks and balances in place. Whereas though, you know, Obama couldn't do all the things he wanted to do because you got right. you got to run it past this group of people and this group of people. And this oh yeah, so they're controlling the whole. Yeah. They ain't just gonna destroy us, but yeah, it's, it's just gonna be wicked shit happening, man. Like this dude, um, comments about his daughter sexually. I would never tell my daughter to prom she looks sexy. I would say you look pretty, you look beautiful. Like and then why you taught? He's he's on TV. He's talking about if I was if I wasn't her father, I would do shit with it like this is real shit you look on you youtube it's like three multiple interviews he where he's that. coming on to her sexually but look what they're teaching us if y'all really is watch what's happening like how and it's not not no gay people with trans they're expecting us to fuck with wicked shit like that so it's like if you got the president saying to do that shit it's, it's just gonna be all crazy it's like you know many um they trying to lessen the time of people don't know about that about child molesters they trying to say there's something wrong with them and give them an excuse I just it's just too many excuses yeah for why we do shit. It gotta be some kind of boundaries. I ain't knocking nobody. Live your life the way you want, but I'm supposed to know what's what's going on. I didn't mean it's right because you're living like that. You know what I'm saying? Y'all set laws for drug dealers and shit like that. When we choose to do shit, it should be other shit for other people. Right. I only saying we should hate them, but it shouldn't be even. You're not regular. <laughs> like flat out something <laughs> wrong with you. You think different. <laughs> I, mean, I mean that's that's real that's real. real i can respect i'm gonna respect you but i'm just like you don't do the same shit i do <laughs> once so again I, I, you know what i'm saying that shit this is like that yeah 
Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. How, it, how can people stay uh, stay up with you and the latest what's going on with you? Um, it's Boss Man Be More. Everything is Boss Man Be More on IG. It's Boss Man Be More on SoundCloud. Boss Man 410 on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Check out the No Trust video. That's the recent video. And then, like, if you're on my SoundCloud, I'm giving people treats. Um, media every Friday. I'm dropping something new, some new content, whether it's a freestyle, whether it's a video, whether it's an interview. Or just me talking some shit to the people. You know what I'm saying? You can tune in Boss Man Fridays. It's Boss Man 410 on Facebook as well. You know what I'm saying? And just rock out with me. And just try and stretch it out and grind out. Uh, you mentioned the no trust. I, I watched that <laughs> video and um, I read comments, right? Right. And so I read this comment uh, under that video that I thought was hilarious. And some, but the, the guy shouted you out and said that uh, he got his girl to do some crazy shit after she watched the video. I thought that was hilarious. Oh yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I wonder what the crazy shit was. Yeah, he, didn't, he didn't say the comment. I just I saw that. I hope she ain't poke a hole in the condom. Because <laughs> <laughs> on the sex scene, that was just like the crazy right, shit, right shit right there. Yeah. So, but shout out to my man Cleon, comedian on that joint. Yeah, he, you know what I'm saying. He did his thing. How mu- how much of that was? Did you know what he was going to say, or he just no? Nah, I mean, I, me and Cleon Ben was supposed to work together. It's like we talked. We just never did it. So I mean, when the time came through the door, I called on him. He uh he showed up. I told him what I wanted to do because I was directing it. You know what I'm saying? I had the input. I was like, yo, are right, you at a dice game? Dude's gonna approach up. The first one he nailed it. He was just like a natural. Yo, definitely dope. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Talented. Yeah. I think if, if you go check a stand-up or anything, you go watch homie. He definitely funny. That and that I would I always tell people, you gotta understand, like I, I'm a real person in heart, so I, I say what I feel. I'm really a fan. That's not because he's from Baltimore. Because I used to always tell people that buy my CD. If you think that shit whack. Don't hold me down just from Baltimore. Maybe you don't hate on me because I'm from Baltimore, but if you ain't got to rock with me, if I ain't making your music what you feel with music, then fuck my music. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how I feel about everybody else's music. I might not shit on it and tell people don't fuck with it because that's hate. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to knock you from getting your paper, but I'm not going to bang with that shit or promote it or nothing. So I, I, I feel the same way. Dude is definitely funny. That's good. Yeah. You, you, um, it, we were having a conversation here a couple weeks ago trying to decide the difference between if somebody doesn't like something, like, does that mean that they hating? No. But man. I think you said it good. You, you said it's like if you tell other people not to fuck with For no them. reason. Right. You, you, you dig what I'm saying? Like, all right, well, if Donald Trump posts something, and I'll, I I may repost it and horse that shit. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But that that's, that's a, no reason. I'm just not going to go. I, if it's brought to you, I guess you got your opinion. Because I guess what, if you was filming me, I ain't know. And somebody be like, do you like such and such? Oh, I'm like, fuck no, I don't fuck with it. But I'm not going to just go on my page and just be like, no, I'm actually lying. I will. So maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Because it got to it gotta feel like you're doing some harm to shit. I've definitely let some shit be like, I don't really care about that. I don't fuck with it. But maybe I, I feel like you just doing the wrong message and the totally wrong shit. Yeah, but and, I mean, I guess if you, you, if you shit, try I will to say, influence that's not other hate, people, though, but if you try to influence other people's, people's thoughts about Going out it. your way. Right, right, I guess, right, you know right, what I'm saying? Right. Going out your way. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've seen shit, like, on comments, like, I've seen motherfuckers don't even, like, on my one of my comments, I'm still gay, and I'm still doing something. It's like, yo, what the fuck did that have to do with the song? And I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. Like, <laughs> that's going out your way. <laughs> even if you had to sit there shit and put thumbs down, I wouldn't have called you a hater. You get the difference? Yeah. Just thumbs down. Be like, I don't like this shit. I'm like, cool. Like, you just said some shit that ain't had to do about the fucking song I post. Yeah. That's a hater. Right. So I, I think that's yeah. where the line draws. Yeah. Like, you can be like, I don't like something, but like, why you got to be like, I don't like him. He phony. He fat. Like, what the fuck was all that for? Just be like, <laughs> I don't like the fucking fucking record, or I don't like your shoes or some shit like that. But people got people, people got opinion about everything. I, yeah, I opinions saw, are, are needed. That's I saw Michael Jackson, Billy Jean. Somebody <laughs> thumbs down that was like, this is bullshit. You know what I mean? Just like, it's, it's Michael Jackson. I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, yo, you got some people that don't even just batter their life. Yeah. I've lived next door to, to some kids that their parents just talk to them so fucked up. I guess they might have grew up haters. It might we got haters. Like, they might come out <laughs> y'all laughing, but they was training their brand like, you bitch, fuck you, like, talking to them. Like, if I was growing up and I was like that, maybe I would be a fucking hater. Like, Shit, all you taught is just be like fuck motherfuckers and hate on them. I actually seen that, so it's like maybe some of these parents fuck some of these kids up. And we got a generation of haters. Wow, that's for some people. A lot yeah. of people probably yeah. <laughs> like searching for attention, but I, I, I definitely want to thank you. But uh, I, I, they gotta stop people 
calling the people to just voice their opinion haters. Yeah, that's yeah. Because that's, that's what they say, oh, you hate them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, now I'm like, you cannot like something and not be hating, but just giving your opinion. Man, you know what I mean? Artists I've seen or work with that you give them an opinion about their song or some shit, and they tell them you hating on it. And I'm like, no, I'm actually not. Because all you got to do is listen to my shit and my um opinion and take it or don't. You got to be strong. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because some people's opinion might help you. You and that, that means that they don't feel comfortable. Change, yeah, to change some shit you want. Yeah, you're not confident in yourself. Yeah, that's yeah. why I say I laugh at shit. And then when people just say left field shit, I'm like, that's a hater. I might put out a record, honestly. And if I'm getting seven dislikes and only three likes, just like to break it down, I might need to listen to the seven people. That's not hating. I put the shit out to get people opinions. I might shouldn't spend no bread to shoot the video and do that shit. So that's not hate. When you just see people, it's all over the place. That shit is just like, yeah. man, you, you're a hater. Block, block them. And fuck them. <laughs> ain't got shit else to do. Uh, I, I definitely want you to come back through uh, when the mixtape drop. Yeah, yeah, that that'll be very soon. I'm gonna pick the. Uh, well, actually, I do have the release date. You know, what I'm saying I'm dropping on June 23rd. Okay. So um, that's gonna light up the summer. It'd be in DTLR, be on iTunes, be on my SoundCloud for free. If you want to cop it, you can. If not, be in the barber shops in the hood. Be flooding that out. Y'all just see it working in movement. And support it if you rock with it. You know Summer what I'm 16. Summer 16. If you love good music, fuck with me. I'm giving it to the city. Be more stand up. All right. That's what's up. Definitely one time for boss, man. Any, any Anybody you want to shout out before we get out of here? Um, just want to shout out the whole city. You know what I'm saying? Shout out my man Peso Music up in this joint. Um, Stoner Lounge. If y'all down with that, maybe I'm um, throwing some dope stoner parties. Fight about that. And uh, you, my nigga, you know what I'm saying? Appreciate me coming through. My man Swin. And uh, Raw Leaf for this new record we about to light the city up with. You know yeah, I like, I, record. I like the record. I like the record a lot. Kick that in. Got a new anthem for y'all. That's about it. All right, definitely. One time for Boss, man. Thanks for coming through, man. Yeah, I love it. So is that live?